All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to a super fantastical episode of Student of the Gun Radio. This is SOTG 1182 coming to you from the, well, it the calendar says that it's the last week of March, but I'm looking outside and it looks like the last week of January. So I don't, not really quite sure what's going on with that, but... Uh, uh, yeah, we were delayed. I was delayed in returning home from gun site by a snowstorm in March, in the end of March. Yes, yes. I'm just about fed up with this now. I'm, I'm about done with it. Well, what are we going to talk about today? We've got a Duracoat firearm finish shooting in the rain. Just shooting in the rain. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we got Brownells March Magnus. Yeah, you heard me say that weirdness. March Magnus. And uh, we have a student in the gun homeroom from Crossbreed uh, talking about why should I be dangerous on demand? There are times when I don't need to be. I mean, there are times when I can just put the gun away and I will never need it. Mm, hot tub death machine. <laughs> Hashtag hot tub death machine. And then we're going to have our friend Cork Graham, the Alaskan homesteader. The real Alaskan homesteader, not some kind of reality TV show bullcrap. Uh, and we're going to talk about many, many, many things, such as how vegetarian and veganism is a lie, <laughs> or it's a deceptive lie. Uh, we might talk a little bit about poop. We might talk a little bit about water. We might talk a little bit about, uh, about land. We might even talk a little bit about geese. Who knows? But that's all coming up on today's super cool, fantastical episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up to your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. See, this is what we are, this is who we are, and this is what we do. And uh, one of the things that we do, if you're watching on Discord, that's right, we have a Discord channel studentofthegun.com slash discord or go to discord and go to the official SOTG student of the gun channel. And uh, what we're going to do this week, we've got a review of the week. That's right. Words from your mouths to our ears or from your fingers to our eyeballs or whatever. And this week's review of the week comes from the discord channel. We do. Yes, Discord. And if you're not in the Discord server, you can go to studentofthegun.com slash Discord. Man, I cannot talk today. Discord. Take a, take a little sip here. <laughs> ah, there we go. Studentofthegun.com slash Discord. That'll get you where you need to go to uh, accept the invite to the server. This is from Dwayne. He said, the Student of the Gun crew are great folks and always speak the truth, regardless if some might find it offensive. It's very refreshing in this time. It's also very informative and entertaining. Your time with Student of the Gun is well spent. Dwayne, we appreciate that feedback very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to be the review of the week, well, in order to be the review of the week, you actually have to leave a review. Yep. If you go what? To, is that so how that works? On, on any of your podcatcher platforms, you go to studentofthegun.com slash whatever the name is. So... The student of the gun.com slash iTunes would take you to our iTunes page. And then student of the gun.com slash Spotify would take you to our Spotify page. And then you can leave your reviews on wherever, whatever platform you use regularly. You guys are on Spotify. Just like Joe Rogan. Oh my gosh. We'll find it. Yes. Just like Joe Rogan. Uh, all right. We have a Duracoat finished firearm segment of the week brought to you by our good friends at Duracoat. All right, shooting in the rain, just shooting in the rain, and that's what we were doing last week in Arizona, 
So uh, for those of you that enjoyed last week's episode, Gunsight Part 1, interviews with Michael Bain and uh, Mike Deddy, Mike Deddy and Michael Bain, uh, if, if, you didn't, if you weren't reaching for a tissue by the end of that episode, you are a soulless monster. And that goes, <laughs> you know who you are. You know who you are. Uh, so we uh, we drove on up. I was in, in the mountains, high up in the mountains, covered in snow. And I knew that I was going to Prescott, Arizona, or the Prescott, Arizona area. Yeah. And I thought to myself, well, I can leave the mountains, drive to the south to the Arizona desert, and it'll be warm and sunny, yeah. or at least warmer and sunnier than ha. the mountains. Ha. Joke ha. was on you. Joke was it. on me. So apparently it's the rainy season. Uh, it is the cold rainy season in Arizona, in northern Arizona, central northern Arizona, whatever you want to call it. And uh, we got there, and it was looking kind of cloudy and windy and, and uh, on the first day, and we went and had dinner. And the next morning, we woke up, and it was raining when we woke up. And we went to Gunsight, and we went to the range, and it was raining. And then it slowed down a little bit, and then it started raining harder. And it rained all freaking day. You know, at least in, in, the nor- in normal world, you go out and it's like it'll rain for an hour or two like in the south. Okay, I'll give you a great example. Whether it's Florida or whether it's Mississippi or whatever, rarely does it rain all sing- all day long. It's usually it rolls in, you get the storm, and it rolls out. You know what I mean? It, it, and it might happen every day, but you can time your watch by it. You're like, okay, 3 o'clock, the storms roll in, get rain. By 4.30, 4 o'clock, they're done moving on with our lives. Uh, So uh, the reason I bring this up during the Duracoat finished firearms segment of the week is, uh, well, first of all, on Tuesday, well, that was the first day, right? It was Tuesday because we had Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we traveled on Thursday. Uh, We focused on the MAC, that's Military Armament Corporation. MAC is back, baby. Uh, On the JSOC, M1911 A1 pistol. And I'm not sure what, Jared, what do they call that finish on the Mac JSOC? It is a something or other finish. It's in my notebook. Yeah, it's in my notebook too, which the notebook that I don't have in my hand. <laughs> but uh, long story short, uh, we, we shot the guns uh, all day long in the rain and uh, then when we were done, we went back into the classroom. And the guys from, from Mac, they asked us to go ahead and get uh, oily rags. Uh, rags Q3, with Q3Q nitrite finish. It's a nitride finish. Yes. Okay. It is So it looks black, and it is a nitride finish. And you say, okay, cool story, bro. Uh, don't care. Why should I care? Well, you should care. Because if you let that thing get wet and then you put it away, stick it in a case or whatever, and leave it there, that wetness is going to cause this thing called oxidation. Some people call it rust. So, well, if they would have duracoated those guns, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> If they would have put a slightly darker black Duracoat finish on that gun, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, so when you you say, well, just the answer is don't go out in the rain and shoot. There you go. That, there's I didn't know not to do that. Don't go outside when it's rainy. But the deal is, is whether it's rain or whether it's snow or whether, let's say you go to Arizona and you sweat on your gun. You know, uh, back in the old days, when we were carrying around blued steel guns all the time, you could tell the guys that had really salty or acidic sweat uh, because their guns would have orange marks on them from uh, from the sweat. From you know, body sweat will make concealed carry guns in Florida or Mississippi. 
Uh, we lived in Biloxi, Mississippi, which might as well be Africa hot. It's jungle hot. It's it's humid. Everything everything rusts. Everything mildews. Everything rots uh, in in Biloxi. And your finish, the finish on your carry gun, is a big deal. It's a BFD. Way back in the olden days, before there was a Duracoat, back in the eighties. Guys were trying to come up with rust-proof finishes, with rush rust-resistant finishes, and uh, they were putting Teflon on guns, Teflon coating on guns. You know, the first person to ever hit me to a Teflon coated nineteen eleven, Jared. Can you guess? No. You know him. He's my first firearms instructor. Oh, Farnham. Farnham. No way. Yeah, Farnham was... I was f- going to say Bill Wilson. Mm-mm. Just because that would have been an interesting juxtaposition there. Yeah, I know. I met John in 86, and uh, he was the first. And, of course, back then, I was young, and I'm like, why would you Why would you go through all that rigmarole and do that? Uh, because when you carry blued steel guns pressed up against your body all the time, every single day... Well, what happens is uh, you sweat on them. Yeah, you sweat on them, and the sweat makes them rust. So what you do is you put a finish on your gun that is a sweat-resistant, rust-resistant finish. What? And this is when you say, from where could I get that? I don't know how I could get a a rust-resistant finish, Paul. Well... Might get it from a little place called Duracoat Firearm Finishes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So if you do that, if you do a rust-resistant uh, finish, you don't have to worry about the rain or the snow or the body sweat or whatever uh, making your gun rust. It's crazy. Uh, so that was Tuesday. Tuesday, we shot the uh, – we focused all day on the JSOC uh, – M1911, and the one we had ran, the one I had ran relatively flawlessly. I think I had, I had one time, they have a flared magazine well, which some people like and some people don't like. Um, and uh, the problem with flared magazine wells is that sometimes uh, you don't get the mag seated if you're rushing or, you know, trying to go fast. Uh, the mag goes in but it doesn't click in and uh, you have issues with that. So, uh, but the, the, the guns ran, uh, we shot uh, a couple hundred rounds the first day and then we uh, combined them. The second day we went, we did a uh, transitioning where we went from shotgun uh, to pistol and I carried the same gun two days in a row because I wanted to get as many rounds through that gun as I could. And, and, I was impressed by it. It was yes, it was accurate. Uh, yes, it functioned well. It didn't have any. Uh, we were using ball ammo, you know, uh, training ammo. And didn't have any hiccups or problems or anything. And on the second day, we primarily focused on the Mac 1014 shotgun. And yes, this is a shot for shot, one to one, exact replica of the famous Benelli 1014. And if you don't know what a Benelli 1014 is, well, you should look it up. Uh, this is a relatively, uh, if you, you, you guys have all seen the silhouette of the Benelli 1014, even if you didn't know what it was, uh, you saw that. And what they have done is they have imported a, uh, a very high quality version of the 1014 and, uh, to this we point, put, we have been notified. A, Go ahead. I was just going to say we put uh, a decent amount of rounds through on the range there, and the only issue I had was because of my gloves. You know, it was cold, so I was wearing gloves, and they kept getting caught in the when I was reloading when I was loading the tube there. Mm. And but that had nothing to do with the firearm. It's it, that thing ran perfectly. And uh, I had no issues with mine. Did you? No, it was the exact same way. When we when they went through, I didn't really have them get stuck during the loading, but we went through an, a a drill where 
we were, they had us download the guns. They had us deliberately try and go into the magazine tube and remove. uh, And with the gloves, it was, it was difficult to activate the, uh, well, to push the little butt lever in to remove the shells. Uh, but yeah, that's I, I that's not the, that big of a deal. I had my thick gloves on because it was so cold, and that was the problem for me. If I would have had my my normal, what are they, tactical gloves, then it would have been fine because they fit my fingers really well. And that, but that's not a gun thing. And the thing is, yeah. you know, and here here's the deal: if you're at the point where you're where you want to unload the tube of your shotgun, that is not a tactical fighting under time issue. You don't know that. Yeah, yeah, I do know that. What do you know about that stuff? And you say, well, okay, you were crying like a baby about how it rained all day the first day. Uh, Did it rain the second day? Actually, it was raining when we woke up, but then it cleared up, and the sun came out, and it was windy as hell. Uh, Is hell windy? Is that what keeps the fire going? Yes, that's what keeps the fire going. So, yeah. Uh, But, uh, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't quite so wet and muddy the second day. It was just it was just uh, just a cold wind blowing, but we survived. Didn't die. Uh, and the just like the the uh, the the JSOC 1911, uh, the 1014 functioned flawlessly. I didn't have any hiccups with it. I never had any failures to feed, eject, extract, anything. Uh, and we fired bird, buck, and slugs uh, through it. Uh, so, and it does have adjustable sight. It has adjustable rifle sights, uh, just like the Benelli M4, or the Benelli 1018 does. Uh, and uh, we were able to, we were whacking a a, uh, a steel silhouette at 85 yards with the slugs with no problem. Uh, and it has a pick rail on top. So if I were to own one of those guns, what I would definitely do is I would get something like a, an aim point T1 or or something along those lines, a micro, and stick it up on there, dial in the dot, and call it good. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, but if you're going to be shooting in the rain, or shooting in the snow, or shooting in the hot, or sweating on your guns, the best way to keep them from rusting is to apply a Duracoat firearm finish. Bing, bang, boom. There you go. Oh, uh, <laughs> so... We've got another. We've got another trade show. We've got a, actually a public show coming up, and so I'm wondering. I'm wondering, do the boys in Ohio have anything for us? Do they have anything new for us? Are they going to be introducing? Are they going to have finished uh, yeet cannons for us? Will High Point have the yeet cannon available? What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, we, we, uh, there was so, what was it? Man, it had to have been a couple months now because time flies when you're having fun. It does. We played a video from the CEO of uh, High Point Firearms and he was saying, hey, we need this thing to be perfect before we launch it. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I really appreciate because in a world where people are just like, get it out as fast as you can, get it out as fast as you can. Just, and then we'll, we'll deal with it later. We'll recall yeah. later or whatever. Yeah, we'll, like, no. we'll fix it later. Release it and we'll yeah. fix it later. <laughs> Yeah, I I appreciate tremendously appreciate the the fact that they're willing to make sure that everything is the way that they know it should be before they ship it. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of mad people out there because they teased it and then and then it didn't happen and it still hasn't happened. But what I'm saying to you, if you're angry about that or if you find yourself uh, in a in a position where you think that you should type on the internet how bad it is, it's like, hey, you should appreciate tremendously appreciate the fact that they're willing to make sure that it is right before it ships <laughs> and at the price point man that's the thing that gets me it's like at the price point for the pistol that you would expect high point to be the company to say just ship it and we'll fix it later that's no, what that's what the haters it. say that's what that's what the haters say they're like no they're just not they're crap and you have to demand it. shut up you're you don't know what you're talking about you know, you're talking about, you know, and the funny thing is, Jared, is like there are companies who in the past have have had the uh, the the model of just ship them and we'll fix them later. And some of the Sierra whiskey, 
40, 06. <laughs> Talk about a gun that was not ready for prime time. The 40, 06. Like, this gun's not ready. Doesn't matter. Ship it. We'll fix them later. I had a, uh, a good friend of mine who was the firearms and the director of firearms training for a sheriff's department, and they accidentally bought the 4006. And out of the 50 some pistols that they bought, 35 of them went back to Smith and West, I mean, S and W, <laughs> for repairs in the first year. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Juxi.com, J-U-X-X-I, the alternative to the other that other company, uh, J-U-X-X-I. This is where you go to watch the videos from the student of the gun. And this is a, a site that is not beholden to Google and it is not beholden to YouTube. And when they don't rely on YouTube servers or Google servers. Jared, do you think that the average... The person doesn't understand that there are only so many servers out there, and all of these websites. You're like, well, every we- well, every website I go to, that's their. They have their own server, right? Potentially, yeah. No, I mean, unless you've been involved in, and you know, with the advent of of WordPress, more people nowadays have at least tinkered with their own website than ever before in the history of ever. So maybe more people understand nowadays, but it is one of those things where it's like, hey, there's, you know, there, and especially for the things that are using a lot of bandwidth, the sites that are using a lot of bandwidth, it's like there's only a, a select few amount of out of the box servers that'll actually support that, and, and especially cloud servers, you have to do a, you have to make sure that you uh, are using a service that can scale with you. Otherwise, it just goes away when you have a lot of people on the site, and that's not a good thing. Yeah. So. Uh, maybe i mean there's there might be people in the audience and, that are yeah end users are so smart. spoiled they're just like uh, i don't know where this stuff on my phone comes from it's just there i mean how hard then with the advent of the wordpress and they're like how hard could it be everybody can make a web page <laughs> yeah yeah everybody can make a web page they sure can <laughs> how many people can support a gigawatt of freaking data. <laughs> it's like, do you know how much data is in video files? In high resolution video files? It's a lot. Uh, so people say, well, if you don't like YouTube, why don't you go ahead and make your own? So they did. They did. Before we get too far, I want to make sure that we mention that. High Point Firearms, you can go check out their booth 5663 at NRA AM, the annual meetings, and you can find out what's there. 5663. Yes, indeed. They will be there. And if you want to go to their booth and cry uh, about the the Yeet Cannon not being available yet, David will be at the booth, uh, and he'll be there uh, waiting to listen to your complaints. Yeah, so this is your... His name is, is David, your, and your he's... Marketing orders are... Go to the booth. Man, I don't know if I should say this because <laughs> oh, he, he's got a good sense of humor. He's got a good sense of humor. So go to the booth, 5663, ask for David, and say, hey, what do you guys got coming out in the future? Oh, man. Oh, someone's going to do that. Someone will. All right. So uh, then you go to, over to J-U-X-X-I, Juicy.com, follow Student of the Gun. People said, if you don't like YouTube, why don't you make your own? Well, they did. Why don't you make an alternative? They did. All right, if you're a new listener or even an old listener, if you're a listener, close that hole underneath your nose, open up your ears, and listen louder. Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right, so... 
I just realized, I was just looking at the calendar, and we only have a couple of shows of these before the NRA annual meetings because it's early this year. It's usually the last weekend of April, first weekend of May. But this year, because of scheduling, they put it in the middle of April, which means as you hear this, there's only two weeks. Yeah, it's crazy. Until the NRA annual meeting. So this is what I need to tell you. Student of the Gun will be celebrating our 10th anniversary We'll be celebrating our 10th anniversary at the NRA annual meeting. We will be doing a student of the gun book signing. And in addition to that, we will be in the Glock booth. That's G-L-O-C-K. If you guys have never heard of it, uh, they make black pistols. Well, they make flat dark earth pistols too. Uh, We will be in the Glock booth. And that's 4755, celebrating our 10th anniversary. We'll be doing a book signing. And we will also, in addition, be there with the folks from Tactical Response because we're going to be doing a celebration of the release of The Four Pillars of Fighting, the book by James Yeager. And if you... We already said it publicly, right? We've already talked about it publicly. Oh, um. Potentially, but yeah, before James of fighting, we're doing a book launch event there. It'll be the Glock booth four, seven, five, five at NRA show. Yes. And so we hope that you will join us for that. If there's one important thing you could do this year to support the Jaeger family, it is that show up for the book signing, show up for the book signing. I mean, the book launch, the book launch. Well, here's the deal. We're going to be doing a book signing. James is not there. James won't be there. He's there in spirit. That's for sure. He won't be there to sign the book, but if you want the book signed, uh, I can do it for you. Uh, Before James departed this earth, in case you missed this story, before James departed this earth, he reached out to me and he said, hey, man, I'm trying to get this book done. I don't know if I'm going to make it. If I don't get it done, will you finish it for me? And I said, "Uh, duh, of course, yes. And then uh, about eight days later, I got the phone call saying that my friend James was no longer with us, that he departed, finished his journey here on earth. And I've been working uh, on that book for, well, several months, for several months, taking the notes, um, every on then the documents and everything that James gave me and compiling it and creating a book. See a lot you're like, well, what's hard about writing a book? You just write words and stuff, and then it's a book. <laughs> yep, that's exactly how it works. You just write words on a computer, and then broom, it becomes a book. Uh, no, the, the process is a, it's a long process. There was a lot of editing. James's daughters, uh, Kayla and Heather, got in there, and they edited it, and proofed it and we went back and back and forth you know with some changes and additions and explanations and elaborations and so on and so forth and i'm very proud of the book and it is available now but we're going to have lots and lots of physical copies at the nra uh, annual meeting so we would love it if you guys would come out and you say what time are you going to do that where we'll let you know Right, Jared. It's uh, yeah. Tentatively, this is the plan, and I and I have not confirmed this yet. But the tentative plan is Saturday at one p.m. at booth four seven five five. Yes. Uh, and if and that changes, you'll hear about it. I, I believe, based on what I know, uh, that we should do additional. We're, we're gonna we'll be there. All right. So pay Here's, attention. Yeah. What I would love from you guys as the listeners is we're going to have a a booth studio set up there. So we're going to be doing this show there at the Glock booth and anybody that is listening to the show and you're going to be at NRA stop by the booth. I would love to get you to, to say into the microphone and into the cameras that you are a student of the gun. There you go. So please, please do that. Come by on Friday as early as you can and we'll give you the information. We'll get you on the the show, the cameras and, and the microphone get you recorded and then we'll also 
do uh, it, we will have the for sure date and time for the book launch event and the 10th anniversary celebration. And we'll give it to you then. And if you, even if you already have the book, you need to come anyway to celebrate the life of James Yeager and the, this, this monumental thing that is a release of his book. And we're looking at doing some giveaways. We're looking at doing some giveaways. So you might just be standing there and uh, win some cool stuff just because you're there. So it's going to be a good time. And if you needed a reason to come to Indianapolis and go to the NRA annual meeting, well, there you go. Now you just have one. All right, Brownells. I need to address something real quick because I know that I've actually had people from our audience message me and say, hey, why are you supporting the NRA show? Why are you going to be there? And the answer is multiple reasons, but the one that will defeat the reason that you're asking is because the NRA is funding 50% 50% of the lawsuit for the ATF brace dealio that's going on. And we had, uh, we had Alex Bosco on to talk about that. If you want to go listen to that show and learn more about it. And th- that should be reason enough for you to understand why are we are going to be there at the show and why we're okay with supporting the NRA. Yeah. And how many other opportunities does the general public have to come together at an, on a national stage? I mean, there are many reasons, but I know that's the reason that the, that, that you're asking. It's like, why are you supporting? Cause they, they did this and they did that. Well, in today's day and age, they're supporting 50%. Uh, they're funding 50% of that lawsuit. So that says that is worth something. And at least to me, I think that that's worth something. So there you go. Yep. All right. Brown Hills bullet points brought to you by. Well, these guys called Brownells. All right, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, uh, it is March. March is almost over, but it's still March as of right now. And uh, they're doing a big a BFD over on the brand new uh Brownells website. Yes, I know it's been there's been a Brownells.com for a long time, but this is a new and improved, fantastically better working website than before. And they're doing a thing called March Magnus. Yes, not madness, M-A-G-N-E-S-S. And if you are thinking that you need to be getting some magazines, now is the time. That's right. Whether it's for 1911, whether it's for your M1A, whether it's for uh, whatever. Fill in the blank, man. Your G-Lock, your M1 Carbine. I'm looking down through here. Your Scorpion, your Magpul. We got uh, two, two, two. Which one is this? Oh, we got the 40 rounders out of stock. Oh, darn. They're out of stock. Wilson Combat Magazines, Genuine Glock Magazines, Beretta Magazines. What kind of magazine do you need? I don't know, but uh, they got them. Well, they got a lot of them. Maybe not every single one, but they got a whole lot on sale. So if you are thinking that you'd be needing some magazines, probably now is a good time to get over there to Brownells and check them out. And don't forget about the new BRN 180 SH stands for shh. It is a silencer suppressor ready uh, upper receiver that you can drop onto any AR 15 standard lower receiver, and it is all set up to shoot suppressed. Yes, indeed. And there's there's even some videos, some some vidjas. There's some vidjas there for you to watch. And uh, you can find out what it's all about. Yes, indeed. That's our buddies, our friends, our pals over there at brownells.com. Check them out. Check them out. All right. Um, what else? Oh, and are they get? Oh, they've got. They're going to be at booth four four zero five four four zero five at uh, the NRA annual meetings. And uh, so they'll be just around the corner from where we are at the G Lock booth. Put that in the wrong spot. You put it in the wrong spot. Yep, that was supposed to be for crossbreed. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you screwed up my notes. All right, uh, are they going to be there? Are they on the list? I didn't see a booth number for them. But oh, so may, so strike that 
reverse it. All right, strike that, reverse it. Now, there you go. But either way, you can visit them in uh, Grinnell, Iowa. You can jump off of Interstate 80 and get yourself a free cup of coffee because Student of the Gun sent you. You can always do that. And uh, if you'd like to watch a video about me trying out a red translucent magazine, you can follow the link that's in the show notes and go to juicy.com and do that. How about that? All right, now it's time for me to be quiet and let Zach to talk for a little bit. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do. And uh, this weekend is WrestleMania. You might be wondering, why am I mentioning that? Well, I'm a nerd and I like wrestling. And so to celebrate WrestleMania 39, if you go over to ShopSOTG.com right now, you can get 39% off of the Fighting Solves Everything book and or patch. Well, look at that. fighting... 39%, 39%, 39th event, makes sense to me. Yeah. So yeah, shopasotiki.com, 39% off the Fighting Solves Everything book and patch right now through next Monday. Good job, Zach. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and March Magnus goes all the way through uh, till uh, April 3rd. So it goes all the way into April. So it's through the next weekend, this, this coming weekend. All right, student of the gun homeroom, talking about being dangerous on demand. Coming to you from Crossbreed Holsters every single week. And we've got a theme song. Yes, Dangerous by Madison Rising. That is the music. In case you forgot, it's been a while since we mentioned it, but it's a a fact. That song is called Dangerous by Madison Rising. And the theme of the Crossbreed Holsters Student of the Gun Home Room is to be dangerous on demand. Dangerous on demand all the time. So, but but there's sometimes when I won't need one, right? I mean, there's sometimes when I just lock up my gun and, and put it away, right? Well, okay. Um, we titled this one Hot Tub Death Machine. We got a story. This is a relatively new story uh, from March 21st, 2023. What happened? For someone who has the fastest internet of all of us, your thing is always loading. I got too much stuff going on over here. Actually, I think mine's faster now. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yours is faster. Yeah. Lion attacks Colorado man sitting in a hot tub. That's rude. A mountain lion attacks Colorado man while sitting in a hot tub was the mountain lion in the hot tub and attacked the man or was the man in the hot tub and um it was a lucky near miss for a man who had an unnervingly close call with the mountain lion over the weekend wildlife officers say that he escaped with just a few scratches despite the animal actually making contact according to the victim he and his wife were relaxing in a hot tub outside a home near Nathrop Saturday night when he felt something grab his head. So at least he wasn't with his girlfriend and his wife didn't know. <laughs> then he would be revealed. He and his wife began screaming and splashing water at the animal. The victim's wife grabbed a flashlight and shined it on the animal, which they then identified as a mountain lion, Colorado Parks and Wildlife said. The light and commotion caused the mountain lion to retreat about 20 feet from the couple in the hot tub. They continued to scream at the mountain lion, and after a short time, it moved up to the top of the hill near some rocks where it crouched down and continued to watch the couple. So it was it was like, hmm, I still might be able to get these guys. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things. It's like you're in a hot tub. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, the couple was then able to get out of the hot tub. It should have their claim wars around the hot tub. Then that would have solved that problem. Oh, was then able to get out of the hot tub and run towards the safety of the house. They called the property owner who was luck. Who's as luck would have it works for Colorado parks and wildlife. So and this is probably like a, a B and B Airbnb yeah. kind of a deal or something. Or, 
or they're renting or something like that. Yeah. The property owner then alerted CPW officers. The first two CPW officers on the scene immediately began searching for the lion following a steep ridge along the creek. No mountain lion tracks could be found due to the freezing temperatures and the frozen snow on the ground. Hmm. They set up a trap, but to date have not located the mountain lion. Mountain lion attacks are rare, but not unheard of. <laughs> I, I love this sentence. So that's the beginning of the sentence. They're rare. Colorado Parks and Wildlife say that this was the 24th attack causing injury to a human in Colorado since 1990. Three people have been killed in the mountain lion attack in Colorado in that same time frame. So 24 over, that's one per year at this point. It's exceedingly no. rare. I'm sorry, that's that's wrong. That is 0.72 attacks per year on average. Mm -hmm. So pretty rare. Still happens though. The victim in this attack was exceedingly fortunate with just a few superficial scratches. Yeah, no kidding. CPW says the man was able to clean and treat the scratches at home. That's good. That's good. We think that it's likely the mountain lion saw the man's head move in the darkness at ground level, but didn't recognize the people in the hot tub. <laughs> the couple did the right thing by making noise and shining a light on the lion, although this victim had only minor injuries. We take this incident seriously. You think? We have alerted neighbors and posted signs warning of lion activity, and we will continue to track the lion and lion activity. Well, here's the deal. I love how they say, oh, he he just was looking, and he saw the guy's head, and he's like, oh, that might be a little animal that I could go over there and eat. I'm just going to... It's like, do you think that the mountain lion, do you think his olfactory senses don't work? You don't think the mountain lion could smell the humans? Think, oh, no. I think the hot tub chlorine, if it's in there, would <clears throat> mask that smell. I don't know. Uh, no, that's not how that's not how wild animals like senses work. Uh, the the fact that you're like you, all the stuff around the the human dwelling that the the animal could smell. Here's the deal, I, and I'll say it again because people in the back apparently didn't hear when an, a wild animal smells humans, it should go the other direction okay it should go the other direction when it says oh i smell people i'm going to go over there that is when you have a problem uh so five days ago this is five days ago i just found this because someone I, I, I sent me a uh while we were in arizona jared I got uh, two mountain lion stories, and I kind of, they kind of got lost in the thing. But uh, so uh, that was on the 21st. That story was from March 21, 2023. We have a story from March 22, 2023. This is, again, this is the super rare, almost never happens if you talk to Mr. Pogue, the wildlife expert, he'll tell you that you're more likely to hurt yourself with a gun in the wild than you are ever to need it to protect yourself. Okay, cool story, bro. This one, New York Post. You got it open? Yeah, it says rafters fight off mountain lion attack with paddles along Arizona River. <laughs> The rafters, like the barn rafters? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, rafters. No. A group of rafters in Arizona had to use their paddles to fight, or in a fight, for their lives against a mountain lion. Gila County officials are urging caution after last week's attack in a remote area of the White Mountain Apache Reservation. The attack occurred, occurred 21 miles downstream from the Salt River Bridge on the White Mountain Ap Apache Nation which is the north side of the Salt River in an especially remote area. A 64-year-old New Mexico resident who was injured in the attack on March 16th is still very sore but expected to survive. As the lion attack as the lion attacked the victim, 10 other rafters attempted to fight it off using their rafting paddles. Eventually the they kept the lion at bay while other campers headed to safety on their rafts. 
What the? What is wrong with people? The White Mountain Apache tribe sent a group of U.S. Department of Agriculture hunters with hound dogs who followed lion tracks from the location of the attack to another area where they were currently trying to locate the lion. As of Monday, which would have been the let's see, something like the whatever the third or something last like that. week, the twentieth. Yeah, the twentieth. As of Monday, the twentieth, the they have not found it. Yeah, okay, and let's let's just pause for a realization. So, do you guys remember the story about the kid being attacked by a mountain lion in California, and we? We brought the story to you guys, and we and this, the update said, remember the whole thing about um, thanks to, uh, or is this private, didn't have access to private land, blah, 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 gave up the search. Right? Remember that? That was only like a month ago. So we had a mountain lion attack. The people didn't shoot the mountain lion. Then they, they went and looked for it, and they couldn't find it. Gave up. We've got Colorado guy. That was California. Colorado guy. Tacked. Doesn't shoot it. Call wildlife officials. It's gone. Can't find it. Arizona. (laughs) Mountain lion attack. No one shoots it. Call wildlife officials. As of press time, can't find it. Does it seem to be a little pattern here? Am, am I crazy? Or and you say, well, well, that's good because now the lion, it it's okay because it it's just going to go back to where it lived and people can go back to where they live and we'll all just move on with their lives. Jared, is that how, it, how animal attacks work? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's what you should do. <laughs> mm. Or... Is it the fact, is it reality, that once an animal decides that it's going to kill a human, it's going to attack a human, it's made that decision that that smell, that that human smell, is food. So it's going to keep doing that until it dies. Once once a bear, mountain lion, wolf, whatever, once it makes a decision, you th- there was 10 people. In this situation, 10. You think, oh, mountain lion's not going to, there's 10 of us. There's 10 people here. I mean, they're going to, it's going to smell 10 humans and think, I don't want to go over there. There's, there's lots of those things over there. I'm not going to go over there. It smelled 10 humans and it was like, why are you guys in my area? It's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to remote. There are no people supposed to be here. Get out of here. No, it, it should take off. It'd be like, no, I don't want to go over there. Uh, the last thing he said is to, here we go. Castaneda said. I closed the story already. Oh, okay, I'll read it. Uh, Castaneda said it is crucial for people to take additional precautions, such as avoiding wildlife and other unknown animals that may have been previously exposed to rabies. He also reminds anyone to refrain from feeding wild animals. I'm pretty sure that these people along the edge of the river were not hand-feeding a freaking mountain lion. You don't know that. And Mm -hmm. I love how they victim shame here. It's like, it's important for people to make sure that they avoid them. There's 10 people sitting on the river bank and a mountain lion comes out of the woods and says, hey, I'm going to kill one of you. How do you avoid that? Well, they, they shouldn't have been in the home where of the, of the animals where the animals live. I've got an idea. How about you don't be a gigant? Why don't you not be a pusillanimous human? And carry your freaking gun. Oh, you can't you can't carry a gun when you go into the wild. Yeah. You can't carry a gun when you go into the wild because according to Mr. Pogue, you might hurt yourself with it. 
and animals, it's super rare. There's we had three mountain lion attacks in the last two months that we've reported on, and it just it it hardly ever happens. California, Arizona, Colorado, but it but it almost never happens. So don't worry about it. Okay, now it's time for our interview of the day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I uh, mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to mention it again. We're going to talk about homesteading and uh, preparing for the future. For the future. All right, um, I'll, I, we need to stop saying that because 98% of our audience doesn't understand. <laughs> yeah, but Those isn't that what an inside joke is? It's like for that, right. that 2% of the audience that gets it. But uh, So we got, uh, we got Cork Graham. We had him on last Friday during the bonus hour during the grad program bonus hour and we started a conversation about banking and the future collapse of the banks and so on and so forth uh and we we talked a little bit about uh about pig poop and uh it was a it was a good time pig poop and fertilizer and so on and so forth so welcome from the great white north uh cork graham howdy howdy good morning as you can see it's a little bit early our time which not that because the it's still pretty dark uh for this time of the year which is getting lighter and brighter and by july we'll probably have about uh one or two hours of like real darkness and then it'll fade back over and we'll start going because that'll be during the summer uh solstice the and solstice, then it'll finally flip over which is june 20th or 21st is it the 20th or the 21st? I can that, never remember. The, yeah, 20, the solstice 21st, is yeah. 20th or 21st. I can never remember. But uh, I remember the solstice thing when I was in school. I remember there's equinox uh-huh. and there's solstice. And I remember SS, summer uh, solstice, yeah. winter solstice. So then it'd be the fall equinox and the spring equinox. We've already had the spring equinox. Is the spring equinox the one where you stand the egg up on end? We did that in like sixth grade. Our teachers had us bring in an well, egg. That's, that's like all that uh, northern pagan stuff. Well, I mean, I it, it's it's true Where? though. If you stand, if you stand, and if you send an egg on end on the, the it's got to be this because we're not you're not in school during the summer solstice. Yeah, and yeah, I don't think it was winter out. I'm pretty sure it was the spring equinox where you stand up an egg and you lift your finger and, and it'll stay standing. Because the poles are in perfect balance, uh, the magnetic. Oh, you Did know you, a cup I'm using today, right? What's that? I just your, realized your pimp hand cup. That's the treasure quest cup. Oh, that's a treasure the, that's the quest. Cup cup. That every, treasure quest on Discovery Channel. We all got these cups. All right. And so that is called the wedding cake. The wedding cake was the boat that was on the show, and it was like full of like wormholes. <laughs> oh, cool. Notice with the whole crew drowning. <laughs> hmm. Dad rules. Dad rules. I got my dad rules cup. What cup are you drinking out of, Jared? Anything uh, cool? A generic cup right here. Oh, generic cup. <laughs> El generico. A generic. El generico. IKEA. <laughs> I have no idea where this came from. <sighs> my wife. There you go. Yeah. All right. So or let's uh, ceramics. Let's uh, start talking about uh, let's start talking about homesteading. Step number one, we, and we talked about this a little bit with Scott and Scott, Todd. Scott and Todd, Scott and Todd, Scott and Todd, about uh, the the idea that people think in order, like, well, I can't do that because I can't afford to buy a farm or a ranch. Well, yeah. the the truth of the matter is it, that you don't need to necessarily buy. 50 acres or a hundred acres or a thousand acres. You know, if you're like, Oh, these, these big farm guys, they have thousands of acres and, and uh, there's no way I could do that. Mm, well, you, you're probably not just going to pick up a thousand acres tomorrow, but, uh, what, what is your, what's your, uh, your credo there? Five acres and a what? And a cow? Uh, five acres and a moose. It's based on an old saying of five acres and a mule. And actually the original term was 45 acres and a mule. Because that's what uh, uh, blacks were given at the end of the Civil War if they went west. And that also was kind of like 
the other homestead homestead act which was 160 acres to all americans who would be willing to move west and that lasted until 1975 in the lower 48 and it lasted until 1985 up here in alaska which meant that you could go off improve the land and you would get title to that land imagine that yeah. people today millennials I, I literally cannot comprehend that millennials today are yeah. like what what 165 acres would cost me a million dollars yeah think about all the things that have happened since then to blow your mind you know people think oh you know anwar and protection of the northern areas of alaska does anybody really realize why that was done if you really if you start looking at it from from the lens of what's happening with the wef right now and so george soros i mean this is a, they didn't just pop out of somewhere this is something that's been planned for decades in taking the independence and the ability of of with the american people especially your ability to take care of yourself. But now what we see what's happening in Holland, you know, and my friend Michael Jan reporting from over there, how the farmers are getting ready to fight a war. But the thing about it is that why are they fighting this war where their own government is basically wiping out any local food production? Isn't that insane? The, I mean, it, what are they doing? It's criminally insane. The yeah. idea that a government would say, you know, we don't, you know what we don't need? Farmers. Yeah. Farmers are, yeah. farmers are the greatest polluters. And what's psychotic is if you ever want to go down a, a, a lunatic rabbit hole, they're mm -hmm. Gen Z people on TikTok. Yeah. There, there's like yeah. a, a whole movement to discredit farmers. Like what oh. in the, where do you think well, your food originates We've seen yeah. this before in history, so we shouldn't be surprised, yeah. right? Well, the the what was it called? The kulakization of Ukraine. Oh yeah, yeah. Where they they well, de they demonize the farmers. Yeah, I made a point about talking about that in the last uh, our last talk, which is with the Red River Valley in Vietnam when I was in prison back in eighty three, eighty four. They were still in the throes of a major national um, famine. In Vietnam, of all places, I mean, think about Vietnam. Vietnam was like one of the most lush, one of the countries of the world where the Vietnamese, uh, the French took it over because of what could be produced there, rubber, pineapples, fruit, vegetables, meats that was shipped back to France to actually get to a point where they were starving because they weren't producing enough rice. And the reason was because they did the same damn thing that they did in Russia, where you had people who lived in the city and you had farmers who, had how many generations of farmers? And you say, okay, we're going to take everybody in Moscow and we're going to move them out into Ukraine and have them work the wheat fields in the same way. They did the same damn thing in Vietnam in the 80s and take these people from Saigon and Hanoi and say, no, you go in the city now. And now all you farmers are going to come in to Saigon and Hanoi. And now you're going to learn how to, to be a, a city administrators. And they're like, what are you talking about? Then you got the other people that, what is this? Rice? How do you plant rice? And if the Russians didn't bring any stuff in, they would have been, the, the whole country would have starved to death if, if the Soviets didn't ship a bunch of food to them. Crazy. So, so you were in prison in Vietnam. In what yeah, year? back in 1983. If, if anybody wants to read a great book, it was an international bestseller in 2004 called The Bamboo Chess. It's available on Amazon. It's been in second edition uh, for about five years now. But it's it's available on Amazon. It's called Bamboo, the Bamboo Chest by Cork Graham. Uh, subtitle: An Adventure in Healing the Trauma of War. There you go. And also, if somebody wants to read another interesting book about the reality TV industry, go over to Amazon and get "So You Want to Be a Reality TV Star." <laughs> That's another good one. Mm. So the uh, one of the things that uh, I was listening, who was, what was uh, the name of the lady from Australia? that Michael was on with like two weeks ago. It hurt. It's like, who are you? Or it's, it's, you know, what I'm talking yeah, about the Australia but reporter from back there. Yeah. She's a reporter from Australia and, and she spells her name like with three O's or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But uh, I was listening. Uh, Rumble, right. Or was it on uh brighty on? Let me see. Uh, 
But my point in phone. speaking that is uh, Michael was talking. He said, he said, people don't understand that in order to survive in the future, that they're going to have to change the way yeah. they think about yeah. day existence, yeah. about daily existence. And he, and he pointed out the, uh, the Netherlands. And what is scary to me and is that the United States media is – uh-huh. essentially bored with or they don't care about the Netherlands story. Yeah. You're like, oh, well, that's another yeah. country far away, and who cares? It's like, well, no, 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 no. They're the second, not the 22nd, yeah. not the 101st, yeah. not the 12th, or, you know. They're the second largest food producer on this yeah. planet. They're like, how can that possibly be? It's got to be Russia. It's got to be China. It's got to be India. No, it's the Netherlands. And the reason that is, is because they've had, what, 10, 12, 20 generations of farmers who are exceedingly efficient and productive. And they've figured out a way to take a small country and to produce Mm -hmm. crazy, literally crazy amounts of food they're, and they're only second to us. We're it. Yeah. So you're gonna. Yeah. So the government is is in an uh, an adversarial situ- position. They've decided that their yeah. own citizens are the enemy, and they're attacking exactly. their own citizens. They're destroying yeah. to in the in order to save the planet. Save the planet for what? Skeletons? Because yeah. I don't know what we're saving the planet for. Because without food, humans don't exist. Uh, yeah. So, what nobody there's not I don't see here any journal supposed journalists uh, in the mainstream news media saying, "Hey, so when we when Nether then the Netherlands gets cut off when they're no longer the second largest food producing nation in the world, who yeah. fills in the gap? Where exactly. from where does the food come? And do we just not give people food? Uh, I'm I'm sorry to hold up the show well, the here, but I, is, why I are they think that there are other people out there like me. I I need to go back to this land titles being given to people for improving the land. Mm-hmm. And that you said that started after this. I didn't learn about this. In, the Civil War, yeah, yeah. So it started after yeah. the Civil War, and why did it originally start? Well, the reason is to take over the land. So the government is using the people through self-interest of the people, which is common sense. I mean, you use the self-interest of the people in order to get them to do things that you want them to do that looks good to them. It's a lot easier than forcing them to go out, which the Russ, the Soviets did. The Soviets did the opposite, which is, no, you you don't have the opportunity to have land out there. You have to go out there because you actually won't own the land. You'll be working for us. It's a collective. And so they created a serfdom. What's that? It was well, a we collective. Don't really, we, we don't really own the it land either. We have, we have to lease it a from collective. the government every single year. That, well, that much is true. But so, so that, okay, that makes perfect sense. And then why did it stop? Oh, it stopped because they started running out of, they, they began re- running out of land. And then also things started shifting. Like here in Alaska, that homestead flipped over to now uh, you can buy land. You can buy the same land that would have been available, but they flipped it over because they wanted it to go towards uh, health and services. So the monies that are collected in Alaska from the sales of those lands in a land auction uh, go towards health services for residents of the state. As compared to before, the land was just available if you would go and improve it. So they're, they did it in order to get revenue for a social program. Yeah, socialism. And that's that. Yeah, because that's the thing. It becomes a, a socialism program, and then it becomes a communist program. And when it gets to the communist state, that's when people start dying because they realize they can't support and take care of these people. So the what's the ugly truth is the, the inconvenient truth, the real inconvenient truth, is you get governments that get to the point where they say, we can't support this population. What can we do to thin it out? And Stalin had no problems about that when he went into Ukraine and he starved everybody by, quote, taxing all their wheat and sending it to Russia that went for export 
and a little bit for the Russian people, but mainly it was just to support the coffers as they were getting prepared for war. Well, if you read the book, the the Holodomor, uh, about that, and there, yeah. there's there's several books, but there's a, there's one that's like called Two Hour History or something like that. You can read the whole book in two hours, and it essentially breaks down what mm-hmm. happened. And what's psychotic is that uh, while the Russian people were starving, Stalin yeah. continued to export food. Yeah. Because, yeah. It, and yeah. there was also an ego component there. He didn't want the world mm-hmm. to realize that they were starving. So he's like, oh, we yeah. have plenty of wheat. We'll, we'll sell you wheat. Oh, so yeah. he's selling wheat to <laughs> Europe while the his own people are starving because he didn't want there to be... Yeah people to think oh well these these people in russia they can't even produce enough food to feed themselves uh yeah. and, and mao took the say you know the funny thing is is mao took the the plan and he ran it even further you know stalin starved a few million people and mao starved what mm-hmm. 40 million or so yeah yeah one of the problems that the i have with that way of friend. thinking is <laughs> that when it's like who yeah. are you to decide whether the land can support this many people. And I'll give you a great mm-hmm. real life example that people in the West just experienced last year. If you look at mm-hmm. last summer, people were freaking out because we're running lo- very low on water and we were, it was true, yeah. but we yeah. didn't know what the, the God's plan for nature was until we hit winter. And it's been, I just saw a new story drop this morning that say it's been the longest and coldest winter in the last 40 years. And we've gotten more snowpack mm-hmm. this year than we have in the last 40 years. It's like, well, maybe yeah. these things have a way of working themselves out. Maybe there's a, a a plan in place that will make sure that humans have enough to sustain themselves. So who mm-hmm. are you to say, we're not going to have enough resources to support this many humans. And that that's, it grinds my gears. Well, there's, there's, that's always been the case with human history. I mean, the, for the, like the entire history of recorded history, like since people started writing crap down, there were yeah. famines. There yeah. were, you know, it's always been ups and downs. Too much rain, not enough rain. Too much rain, not enough rain. You know, and then then you had those beautiful seasons where it was just right. You know, just the, the right amount. But it's up to humans to prepare for that to exactly. understand that you know what it's it's kind of like when you have a checking account when you're 20 years old or 22 years old and and you balance it so that you can hopefully not go to zero before your next yeah. check gets deposited you know yeah. and then you yeah. grow up and you become an adult okay. and you realize you know that's probably not the best way to live i don't want to well i don't want to constantly be running it to to one dollar you don't you like know. to live on the edge yeah and Oh, and, the, and the thing is, is, you know, human beings, farmers, you, re, mm-hmm. you know, whether you read the Bible or whether you read the farmer's almanacs or whether whatever. But if you read history, it's always been the responsibility of the producers. They always said they're like, we you always if you're if you have cattle, you want to grow more hay than you're actually going to need. You don't get yeah. the minimum amount because you don't know how long this winter is going to be. Maybe you'll get lucky. Spring will come and, you know, the second week of March, snow all melts off and your cattle are out there eating. Great. This year, we're not where I live. The cows aren't going to see the grass until mm-hmm. after Easter, probably. Until it starts snowing again. <laughs> yeah. T- I yeah. mean, right now, there's four feet of snow behind my house. There's a, there's four yeah. feet of snow on the ground. Yeah. And, and it's almost April. Cork goes, yeah. you amateurs. Yeah. yeah, I got it. We're prepared for it going until another. Yeah, right now, I look at my window and I got about, yeah, about three feet. Yeah. Just enough to go skiing. I'm going skiing today, finally, after two years of having my new skis. So, ski you know, we've talked about this, uh, I guess, I don't know, ad nauseum. And I kind of, I kind of got to believe that if people aren't paying attention yet, then they're never going to. But there may be some yeah. people out there that, that are going to pay attention. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the main thing is, you know, we, we talked about the, the preparation, you know, like the immediate stuff, like, okay, the power goes out, bam, out of nowhere, the power goes out or there's storms and we can't get to the store. What can we do for a few days, a week, two weeks, whatever, but we've got to start thinking beyond, we've got to start thinking mm-hmm. beyond that two weeks of, of, you know, storm prep, you know? 
we've got to start thinking to renewable. We've got to start thinking, you know, exactly. what will I be able to do next year and next year and next year? And, uh, you know, like, do you have chickens or ducks or geese? What's your bird of, of choice up uh, there? And, uh, geese. And we use the geese are basically guard dogs because when those things go off, I never have to worry about anybody sneaking up, you know, on the property. And you got to watch out for that stuff because people don't realize the importance of having providing your own security. Like if I was to call the Alaska troopers on average, it would take about 35 to 45 minutes in an emergency 911 call for anybody to get here in time. Yeah. So in that time, some, somebody could kill you and, and take your stuff and be out of here and nobody even know. So that's the reason I, I carry 24 seven. I just have, I have, I'm armed all the time, well, whether yeah. it's actually on or it's within, you know, like I'm watching TV. I can just immediately reach for something. And then from that, I can get to boom. Three yeah. second rule. Yeah. Three second rule. The Cooper's three second rule. I never yeah. thought about the, using geese as an alarm system. I always use, you know, you, you ha, do you? Well, in, that's what they're used. They're used, they're used as guard dogs in Indonesia. And that, when I was a kid living in Southeast Asia, I, I learned about geese, not as food, but as, as guard dogs that actually would attack you if they're really mean, but uh, they just go off. And I have, uh, I have 19 of them. And since I've gotten that many geese, I've never lost a chicken to an eagle. But before I was, I was losing chickens to, to, uh, to uh, um, eagles all the time. The goshawks, the goshawks still, those guys are predators. If you've ever watched a goshawk, that's freaking impressive because those guys are killers. <laughs> they, they do not stop. I mean, they, they, they focus in on a target and they do not stop until they've got that target or something happens to them. How about other predators? Like, uh, like you don't have coyotes. Do you have coyotes up there or just wolves? Uh, we have coyotes. We have wolves. Uh, what's the other one? Wolverines. 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 The Wolverines. <laughs> what's that? I want to feed your fingertips to the Wolverines. The Wolverines. Yeah. Little John Belushi there. <laughs> And then we got uh, brown bears. I got 10 foot, 12 foot brown bears here, about 1,500, 1,600 pounds. So I sent you that. I had the scratch yeah. marks on the back. Did the yeah. geese? Did the geese scare away the bears? Yeah, they do. <laughs> Predators are actually very timid. You learn that in the water when if the thing you're always taught is if you can see the eyes of a great white shark and the great white shark can see you. A, you're safe. It's the shark you don't see. The guy that comes right out of the depths and comes Behind peeling you. up and kills you. But if he sees you, he's like, oh, I got to get out of here. You know? Yeah. And that's the same with bears. The bears, uh, that's why you do the confrontation when, you know, where you get big uh, with like cats. They say don't do that with bears. But uh, I'm a believer of like you yell at the bear and say, hey, get out of here. And I've, got, I've been charged by a bear. I was um, three years ago, I was deer hunting on Kodiak. And I was using a deer call. And so I'm calling. And my buddy's behind me. And, I, and, I, and later I said, did you get that on camera? He goes, no, I thought you were joking. I said, dude, when I start saying the word bear on Kodiak, I ain't joking. So, <laughs> so I'm calling, you know, with a wah, wah. And that's what you use to call in blacktail deer because it'll bring in the doe. And then the buck will follow during the rut. That buck will follow that doe in. And so I'm calling and calling. And it was weird because, you know, when you have a background where you hunt pigs, like wild boar, you know, from back in California and Texas, you think you think more along those lines. You don't think, even though you are on an island where it's like, that's where they are. That's where it's called. You had brown bear for a reason. So I'm calling, and I see this. Ba- I see the back of this bear coming in. And I said, oh, that looks like a pig. Like, in my subconscious mind, it said, oh, that looks like a pig. And then Your suddenly I thought. was like, I'm not going to believe this. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what your subconscious said. It can't be a bear. So your 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 automatic response is like it's a it's a pig, and then I saw its head, and then I was like, "Hey there!" And he went he went and he looked at me, and I was like, "Get out of here!" And and this was the baby because there's a sow. I was running. I was hunting behind my friend's house, uh, cat lodge cabin, and he's had the sow. The mother has always been there. She is freaking. She's got to be 1,800 pounds. I mean, she is a monster. And she she dens up under his house during the winter. 
You know, she goes under the, the deck and she stays there under winter. And then she goes off, you know, when the snow goes away back in spring. But these were one of her cubs. And her cubs were easily 800 pounds. And, I was, and this was just this was little, one of them. Just a little yeah. guy. Just what a was, little what guy. What was Yogi's buddy? Boo-boo. 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 Boo-boo the bear. Boo-boo. That's right. We have nicknames for these bears, which is, this one's Boo-boo. They're looking yeah, for a so picnic I, basket. I ran into Boo-boo today. <laughs> Uh, so let, let's let's try and figure out how to give people something. Uh, Cork, did you read the? Uh, remember when Michael was talking about the uh, the how the king, the former king, he's not the king anymore of Thailand. Back in Thailand, yeah. How he the he, way back though. We're talking like back in the sixties and seventies, forties. It was that king. The and, and how he uh, he saw the famine coming. Mm-hmm. And they yep. they did a reorganization essentially, mm-hmm. where rather than try and do a collective or centralized food production, he's like, no, we don't yeah. want collectivization. Yeah. We don't want centralization. Rather than three mega farms, we want mm-hmm. thirty little farms. Right. You know, rather than twelve food processors in the whole country, we want two hundred food processors. Which, exactly. if, if you had a yeah. reasonable, rational brain in your head, you'd be like, yeah, it's obviously way better to mm-hmm. have, you know, 200 local butchers than three meat processing plants that, that, I mean, look at what happened in 2020, 2021. Oh, the COVID hit the, hit the meat processing plant and they had to shut it down. Yeah. And, and the meat processing plant supplies four states. All the meat yeah. comes from for four states comes from one plant. That's lunacy. That's idiocy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that I am surprised about is the the ability for our supply chain system to continue to operate. Because it's been well, it's twenty twenty three now, so it's been about two and a half years since the the uh, hysterical response to COVID happened. Yeah. And we haven't seen, we've seen price increases and whatnot, mm-hmm. but I think most of it's due to the, the inflation and the printing of money and not the yeah. lack of food. And I think that we're going to get there this year or, or next year, but it's amazing to me that it's that big of a gap, right? And if you think yeah. about it, if you have a two-year warning time, then you've got enough time to get your affairs in order. And mm-hmm. it's just, it, it amazes me that the time frame for seeing the effects in our local area is so long. It's going to be three years or four years before we actually see the effects. Well, if people got to start really looking at the propaganda machine that is being at the behest yeah. of people who aren't really looking at the best interests of quote, the common person. And I'll give you an example. So I'm an, I'm a, I'm a bush pilot up here in Alaska. Right. And um, fly bushes. What are the- Think they're talking about how there's such a demand for pilots, right? Have you ever un- wondered about the question of like why is there suddenly this major demand for all these pilots? And, and but the answer, the answer that everybody's saying is, oh, well, we've got all these pilots, you know, who are getting older, and there's this whole generation of pilots who are are they're not going to be able to continue working because the limit right now is 65. So why is it, if that's the case, and you're the owner of a company, this isn't something that's going to be a surprise because you know how many are on your roster who are employed and you have their ages recorded and you would say, okay, we have this number of pilots who are going to go past the age of 65 and will have to be retired. So we need to prepare at this time to fill those slots. But what we're having right now is we're having like this emergency, almost an emergency order of like, we need as many pilots as we can and we got to get them in and we got to get them in quick. I look at it as, and this is the result of what we've been learning about how Pfizer and they didn't do any testing on the vaccine and how the vaccine has been released, that if you're under the, uh, under the understanding that, oh, well, the, the the vaccine worked in great, then you think, well, we're going to believe what they're saying about the generational quote theory about getting people out at 65. But if you look at it from the point that they don't want you to know, which is we force a ton of pilots 
both in the civilian arena and in the military arena to get this unproven vaccine. And now we're seeing the physical effects. And I have my I've talked to a number of FAA doctors who won't publicly tell you because they're afraid. Oh, shoot, I don't want to screw things up, you know, with the people who pay me money, which is these drug companies. Um, they're telling me flat out that there are, there are pilots left and right who are either not being able to pass their physicals. I know from one situation where one person had made a comment about all his friends. He had 10 friends. So something to think about right now. 10 friends. Uh, of the 10 friends, five are dead right now. Five are dead. Right? And for weird reasons like heart attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Of the other five that are still around, um, three of them cannot pass their physicals. So they're done. Two of the 10 uh, pass their physicals, but they're sick all the time. And so they don't ever want to fly. So think about that. So that's the number of a group. And this is up here in Alaska of pilots because we have a really tight community. And we talk about this thing going, did you hear about such and such? So if you look at it from that point of view, that is an emergency. And also you have a situation where what's the company going to say? So, you know what? We kind of screwed up. We maybe shouldn't have forced you to take that shot. And, but we don't want you to know about it because we don't want to be sued by you. So if you've got a media company that is all tied together with all these other big corporations and they're paying off the media to say, oh, well, we don't want them to know that this is the real reason we got to fill the, all these pilot slots. What's happening with the rest of the world and how this is playing out and how people are you going to be able to work on your farm? Do you have the physical capability? Or how do you feel right now? Because you did get the shot. How many people are having questions about, God, you know, I, I'm not I'm not the way I used to be since getting the shot. I know having getting COVID that I'm not the way I used to be. And I've been told that, yeah, there's some issues that when you've got COVID, but when I had COVID, it was like the flu. It went through and I, and I had it uh, twice for sure that I know of. Second time was the second time was actually when I got the, the loss of smell. But then the, the loss of smell went away. But then you have like these other weird smells that affects it. But other than that, I've been fine. I never it's got interesting. it. Interesting, and I'm glad that you're talking about this because we. I don't think we've had anybody else on that is a pilot or in that industry. So nobody's ever said this nobody on wants the show to have because you, the only way that you would know is if you either are in the industry or you have a close friend that that talks to you about it, right? So uh, yeah. thank you for bringing that information to the audience. Yeah, knock on wood. I mean, we're all okay. <laughs> This was a bioweapon that was released into the world. Oh, the no, question, no, no. It was an accident. It was bat soup. Conspiracy theory. It was bat soup. What that? Oh, it's true. And they're ready to declassify all the information because they want you to know that it came from a lab. But it's, that same freaking information was considered a conspiracy theory in 2020. Well, think, think about things that uh, think about through history. If you want to limit a population, a human population, because the, exp uh, the population explodes. How do you thin a population? How do you let's look at it more along the lines of a of a game manager on a ranch? How do you call your 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 population to make sure that you have just a certain amount to be supported by the resources on that ranch? And if you are of the power elite and you look at the world and you say, This is our world, and all these people below us, you know, like you and me, the serfs. We need to. We want. We want enough there so that they can be our slaves, and they can produce food for us, and they can produce technologies for us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this fantastical episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Thank you to Cork Graham for joining us. Uh, we had a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information for you guys today, uh, but you deserve it. You deserve it. You're worth it. So this is what I'm going to say to you. Until we're together again. Remember, you're a beginner once, you're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com.